We're honored today to have Josh Haven here, and we thank him for coming up to take Carl's place for just this Sunday, and, and uh, so I'll just go ahead and turn it over to him. Welcome him. Is my mic on? Got it? Sounds like it. All right. Well, fun little bit of trivia. Uh, my very first time standing in a pulpit was 17 years ago in Pastor Carl's church. <laughs> so I've been, I've been preaching not, not full-time ever since, but occasionally ever since. And uh, I love being with the, the people of God. It's a, it's a good place to be. Well, before I start, I need you to know a few things about me. I grew up in church. Uh, my parents were both raised Lutheran and then uh, became Pentecostals shortly after I was born. When I was five, they became missionaries. We lived in Germany uh, for almost five years. So I grew up being the missionary's kid, the deacon's kid, the worship leader's kid, all of those. And basically, uh, everyone was always watching me to see how I behaved, how I uh, would mess up, and to this day, honestly, I still worry a lot about what other people think of me. Um, it even got so bad that at 26 years old, I was so broken that I hit a depression so deep, uh, I'd get home from work and then just spend the, the rest of my night curled up on the couch waiting for the night to end, um, just so that I could somehow muster up enough energy to get to, to work the next day. Uh, it was winter in Iowa, and I'd go up, I'd get out, bundle up, uh, go for two-hour-long walks in 10-degree weather in a foot of snow, and there were a few times when my wife, Alicia, wasn't even sure that I would be coming back. Um, it ended up putting me in the hospital with chest pains and breathing problems, and it was, it was just really, really bad. I thought I was dying, and it was all because that young adult body um, still contained a broken little kid trying to figure out how to live in the world, how to deal with life. Now, a lot of you are a lot wiser than I am. You've lived longer. You've had experiences that I'll, I'll never have. Um, maybe it's even been worse for you than that. Uh, maybe you were told that you've never, you'd never amount to anything, and you've been carrying that for 40, 50 years. Maybe you've had your heart broken more times than you can count. Maybe you've even given up and decided to end it all a few times, but could never quite pull the trigger. Whatever you've been through, I'm telling you a bit about myself because I need you to know that I'm not up, just up here just blowing smoke. I'm not, I'm not going to go into the deep, dark stuff that I've been through today, uh, but I do want you to know that you're not alone in feeling broken and unlovable. You're not alone in feeling worthless or hearing the your parents' voice in your head telling you that you'll never amount to much. And I tell you all this because I want you to grab hold of one simple truth this morning. God loves you. And it's sometimes cliche when we hear that, but I want you to think about each one of those three words. God, the almighty God that we were just singing praises to, loves the unconditional love, the unending love that we were just singing about. You, the broken you who's been walking through life trying to figure things out, never quite sure that you're actually going to make it in the end. You might be thinking, yeah, he does, but, you know, that's, that's just what he does. He's God, right? Or maybe, yeah, but he doesn't like me. He loves me, that's what he's got to do, but he doesn't like me. Or maybe you just don't believe it at all. I've met very few people who can hear the words, God loves you, and truly grab onto the implications of that statement. I'm still definitely working on it myself, but I'm beginning to catch a glimpse of something that I can't and don't want to let go of. And I'm either grasping at straws in what I'm going to say this morning, or there's something here that can change the way we live our lives. I'm not talking about a salvation or a conversion experience. I'm talking about a life-changing realization that can happen even years or decades into your relationship with Jesus. For the next few minutes, I hope to find a way to make God's love for you a little more real. 
I hope to find a way to get that truth to move from something that you accept up in your head to something that you hold on to in your heart. It's easy for us to think about something and, and just know it. It's another thing for us to really believe it deep down inside. Because when that starts to happen, your life and your purpose begin to change. And it'll be more than just an extra little spring in your step that'll get you through your day. It's a change that affects literally everything that you do, from the way that you go to sleep, the way that you wake up, eat lunch, raise your kids, drive to work, everything. I'm going to give you a $10 word real quick this morning, get your money's worth out of this. Just tuck this away in your back pocket for a few minutes. The biblical Hebrew word chesed usually shows up in English Bibles as uh, loving kindness or steadfast love. Um, in Numbers 14, the people of Israel are being real screw-ups in the wilderness. Moses decides to pray and ask God to forgive them. He pleads with God and says, Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your chesed, your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. This love from our Father is a patient love that will never end. He put up with the people of Israel for a really long time in the wilderness. And this love is demonstrated ultimately in Jesus. The way that he came, lived, and died all demonstrate how, it, how and what it means to live as a child loved by God. So this morning, I want to help you understand three truths about yourself. Really, there are three truths about God that Jesus demonstrated. When you begin to grab hold of these truths, you'll probably spend the rest of your life trying to work out what it means to live in response to these. Here they are. Number one, God knows you are broken. Without the constant grace of God in everything, from the moment you're born to the day you die or Christ comes back, you are broken in one way or another. Number two, God loves you in your brokenness. And this one sounds really weird to a lot of Christians, especially those who think they can get it all together by how they perform, how well they do it, not sinning. But this is the gospel. This truth is incredible. Finally, number three, God has called you in your brokenness. That purpose that he has for you in your brokenness can really only reach its full potential when you accept those first two truths, that you are broken and that God loves you in your brokenness. Open your Bibles, turn to John chapter 8. We're going to take a look at one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Uh, in, uh, we'll be reading from the, the uh, verses 3 through 11. In this story, we find a story of Jesus confronted by others with a woman who's now being publicly shamed. This woman has broken the laws of the land, broken the moral laws, broken the civil laws by doing something that was illicit with another man. Uh, we don't know whether she was married, he was married, but we know that it was um, considered adultery. So, uh, starting in John 8, verse 3. The scribes, and I'm, I'm reading from the ESV, by the way. Don't worry if you've got a different version. It's not a huge deal. The gist of the story is the same. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman's been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? 
She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. John wrote his gospel to give us a glimpse of Jesus, the real flesh and blood Jesus. Because when you see him in all the goodness and steadfast love, the chesed he demonstrates, you're drawn to believe that he really is God. And like Jesus said in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen God. So here we have a picture of Jesus, the revelation of God himself. And what do we find in this scene? It's the same God to whom Moses prayed, pardon us according to the greatness of your steadfast love. You know, a lot of us like to look at the God of the Old Testament and think that he's a, a, a vengeful God out to destroy humanity and those who aren't on his side. But if Jesus is right when he says that I'm the one who reveals the way God really is, then when Moses prays to God in Numbers 14, he has the same character that Jesus demonstrates. Now keep this at the front of your mind because we're going to go deep for just a minute and this may be just a little uncomfortable. In their book, Does God Really Like Me? Jeff and Sid Holsclaw argue that the root of all sin is actually shame. When Eve was having her conversation with the serpent in Genesis 3, the temptation wasn't an overt temptation to just disobey God as if she somehow naturally wanted to be a rule breaker. It was a jab intended to shame her. The serpent points out, you'll be like God. In other words, you're not like God. You're not as important as he is. You're not as valuable as he is. You're not as wise as him. You're not enough. Now all of a sudden, the fruit isn't just a way to break God's rules. It's a way to cover up the pain that the shame produced. It starts to look real desirable if that's your way to be valuable, to be wise, to be enough. When I was nine years old, I was invited over to a friend's house to stay the night. It was his birthday, and uh, several of us were going to go see a movie together. And when I walked in the door, his mom yelled out, hey, Josh is here. And he comes running down the hall, and he stopped, kind of like a stopped dead in his tracks kind of a look. Uh, when he saw me and he said, oh, Josh Havens. I uh, wasn't the Josh that he thought I was. He was excited that another Josh in our group was going to be, to be coming, but not as much as me. And in that group of friends, I was always the younger one trying to fit in with the rest of the group. And experiences like this only served to reinforce that I wasn't enough to fit in with the group. So to fix that, I would do anything to fit in and make myself feel valued by the group. Uh, even if it meant telling dirty jokes or acting in ways that I shouldn't. And I felt ashamed that I wasn't enough. So my behavior became a way of covering that pain. By the way, parents, if you're struggling to understand why your kids do what they do, look for the shame that they may be experiencing. Shame and the fear of rejection drive us to do incredible things out of self-preservation. And even as an adult now, I do things that I normally wouldn't do uh, out of a fear that I won't be accepted. I do things like that with my wife, Alicia, with my best friend, Chris. And if you want to see this kind of thing happen in person, just get together with old acquaintances you haven't seen in a while, like maybe at a high school reunion or something like that. Nine times out of ten, the conversation inevitably becomes a contest to see whose life has been better since you last saw each other. You usually walk away feeling like the other person has life all figured out and uh, they're the ones who've, who've got it all together and yeah, who am I? I know what my life is with all of its brokenness and I'll never amount to the kind of person that they are. And it's funny, pastors do the same thing. We'll get together sometimes at conventions or area meetings and we'll start talking about all the good things that God's been doing at our churches. We'll say, oh yeah, God's blessing our ministry and even though we have challenges, things are great. Uh, when all the while, this COVID junk has really messed with things, we almost always struggle with a sense of inadequacy because we know all the things that are going wrong. And we're ashamed of it when we talk to other pastors who apparently have this thing all figured out. 
We want to cover that shame, and so our church reports, the times that we spend with other pastors become an opportunity for us to cover up that pain. A few years ago, I planted a house church. It, it never really took off. Honestly, it was a complete failure. Um, there were uh, several times when I would meet with other church planters in the area, and the nine-year-old me would come bounding back to the forefront uh, to remind me, hey, be sure you do something that they'll like. Be sure you do something that'll make, you accept, or make them accept you. And so despite the failure that the church plant was, I put on a face that said, oh yeah, I'm fighting the good fight. Uh, we've had a few families come and go and things are tough, but man, God's good. And after learning this lesson about my insecurity and brokenness, my next line of thinking went something like this. Okay, God, I get it. I'm broken. Thank you so much for your grace. Can we move on now to bigger and better things where my brokenness and my sin aren't part of the conversation anymore? Can I stop having to deal with this lesson about my own brokenness? And over the last, oh really, the last decade, God's steadfast love has been working overtime in my life to make sure that I realize the answer to this question is no. Let's start over again. Because my question, you see, missed the point of the lesson entirely. In wanting to get past my brokenness, what I wanted from God was a bit of healing so that I could then be perfect. And if I'm perfect, others would accept me. So I was looking for a way to get my shame out of the way so that, that I could be the kind of person that would make others value me for who I was. That solution, though, doesn't deal with the shame problem at the core of who I thought I was. And a lot of us do things like this. We want to hurry past our sins, get the grace to cover them, and be on our way. It's like those times when you end up doing something really, really stupid. Uh, like maybe you pushed a cart into a, a big pile of cans at Walmart or something like that and knocked a few over. And you look around to see if anybody noticed that you did something dumb. We do the same thing in the Christian life all the time. We make mistakes. We look around make sure nobody saw us. Maybe we even confess or display some kind of vulnerability, and then we move on, like it never happened, all so we can keep up the appearance that we really are like Jesus, because if we're like Jesus, then we're okay, and if we're okay, we have nothing to be ashamed of. This betrays what we really believe in our hearts, though. It betrays what we believe about ourselves and what we believe about God. It shows that we don't believe we're worth loving and that our acceptance somehow depends on how well we do at keeping our lives together and not sinning. We believe we have to hide our shame because if anyone saw it, they would reject us. If God saw it, he would definitely reject us. It's the same feeling you get when... Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever had one of these rapture scares. You go in and uh, suddenly all the Christians that you thought were supposed to be at a place aren't there. And you're the only one left standing and you wonder, oh man, did I miss it? Did I get this wrong the whole time? It's that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. This thinking and this way of living, which I'm coming to find is a problem for even the most successful followers of Christ is really a struggle to grasp our identity as a child of God loved by him. We don't understand that we really are his children, that he really does love us and want the best for us. And so we try to make sure that others see we're something special. We try to make ourselves believe that we're someone special who has no flaws, who makes no mistakes. But the reality is that we are broken. We are ashamed. We do make mistakes. We even lie to ourselves and say that we don't. We tell ourselves and others that we're better than we really are. Brennan Manning, a uh, priest who struggled with alcoholism and became a prolific writer on God's grace, calls this the imposter or the false self. It's a broken way of living. The more we try to fix it, the more we try to undo the wrongs and remove our false selves, the more brokenness we actually end up leaving in our wake. 
And this is why our desire to just get past the brokenness misses the point altogether. It's because, and here's the important point, the problem isn't your brokenness. We think the solution is to not be broken, but we miss the problem that caused it in the first place. We forget about the shame. We forget about our lack of security in who we are as children of God. And from what we see in Jesus when he comes face to face with the adulterous woman, there's only one solution to that. We have to accept that God loves us in our brokenness. He doesn't just love some idealized version of us. He loves the broken us. Because it's not about fixing the brokenness, although he wants to do that. It's about being able to know that we have a place to take our brokenness. He didn't ask the woman if she promised to never do it again. He didn't put her through some program to fix all of the broken things about her that caused her to want to have affairs with other men. He simply showed her that he loved her as she was and not as she was supposed to be. God does the same thing for you when he sees your brokenness. He loves you as you are and not as you should be. Because there's not a single person in this room who is as they should be. So number one, God, or God knows you, you are broken. Number two, God loves you in your brokenness. Look back for a moment on the way that Jesus treated the woman caught in adultery. Look at the response that he gives to her. Look, away, look at the way that he treats the Samaritan woman a few chapters earlier in John chapter 4. Look at the way that he spends time with tax collectors and prostitutes and other sinners. We get so worried that God's going to reject us because of our flaws and our tendencies to sin and our brokenness. But everything Jesus did says that's not going to be the case. And when God saves you, the process of sanctification uh, begins. That's when he starts the process of making you more like Jesus, more saintly. But it's like the first 0.1% of the process. And we like to think that heaven is about getting the other 99.9% .9 taken care of. If like somehow we hit 100% like Jesus, all of a sudden we're good to go. We've taken care of things. By the way, it's not like that. Even if we know that to be false and that salvation is by God's grace alone, a lot of times our actions say that it depends on what we do. We think there's some point we, we reach when we're living a good Christian life when we no longer need God's grace. When we no longer have to be ashamed. And as I study history and as I spend time looking uh, through the lives of the heroes of the faith, walking with other Christians, I'm finding more and more that the closer we get to God, the greater our remaining sin and brokenness appear as well. It's not that we were ever... We, we go from less broken to more broken. We just become more aware of all the brokenness that's still left inside of us. Let's take a, a little math example here real quick. I promise this won't be a tough one. Every circle has an edge, right, called a circumference. And, it gets, uh, and as the circle gets bigger, the circumference, the perimeter of the edge of the circle, gets bigger as well. Uh, it's like if you're, if you're shining a flashlight in a dark room or at a wall, you get a really narrow beam, the... the the focus of the light is really small, and the darkness around the edge of the circle is fairly small. But as you step back and you make the beam bigger, the, the darkness around that light gets bigger as well. I'm finding our growth as Christians really does the same thing. The more we grow, the more darkness we see that has, hasn't been dealt with yet. The more we see that darkness, the more we're tempted to feel hopeless. But here's the really cool thing. That fear and hopelessness disappear entirely when we realize the point of the gospel is, and God's love for us isn't contingent on how much darkness is left. And here's the weird thing in all of this that just doesn't make sense to us sometimes. 
God loves that broken you with all of that darkness surrounding you, with all that brokenness inside of you. He loves the woman who's even in the act of committing adultery. He loves the addict who's going back to their medicine of choice. He loves the pastor who's ashamed and tells everyone their ministry's never been better. He loves the nine-year-old kid who can't handle being rejected. And of course, he doesn't want the, sh- the sin and the shame and insecurity to continue in your life. But his primary concern that we get from the life of Jesus is that he wants you to know you are loved in your brokenness. He wants you to be able to come to him in your brokenness. And it's your willingness to come to him that is the undoing of your shame. In fact, in Jesus, he came to you first. He went looking for you while you were broken. And even as you follow him in your brokenness, he simply says, stay close to me. I love you. Don't worry about all that darkness anymore. I'll take care of it. Just stay close to me. Nicholas Herman was a 17th century Frenchman who described himself as a klutz who always broke things. He was injured in the Thirty Years' War and ended up with a permanent disability in his legs. He later decided to join a monastery and took on the name Lawrence of the Resurrection. Uh, Some of you might know him as Brother Lawrence. He wasn't good for much other than being a cook and repairing sandals of the other monks in the monastery. He was always afraid that the higher-ups in the monastery would, in his words, skin him alive for all of his faults and failures. But he caught a glimpse of God's love in that place and became known, not just in the monastery, but throughout the area, for his closeness to God. In a letter to a friend, Brother Lawrence described God's love like this. To sum up, kind sir, I'm sure that my soul has been with God for more than 30 years. I consider God my king, against whom I have committed all sorts of crimes. Confessing my sins to him and asking him to forgive me, I place myself in his hands to do with whatever he pleases. And this king, who's full of goodness and mercy, doesn't punish me. Rather, he embraces me lovingly and invites me to eat at his table. He serves me himself and gives me the keys to his treasury, treating me as his favorite. He converses with me without mentioning my sins or my forgiveness. My former habits are seemingly forgotten. Although I beg him to do whatever he wishes with me, he does nothing but hold me close. That's what being in his holy presence is like. This is exactly what we find Jesus doing in John 8 when he says, Neither do I condemn you. By all accounts, this woman should have been justly executed. The teachers and the scribes and the Pharisees, they were right. She, met, she was supposed to be executed right then and there. Jesus lets her completely off the hook. No questions asked. In Jesus we see God's revelation of what justice actually is. It looks like being let off the hook for adultery. It looks like tax collectors and prostitutes hanging out with Jesus while he seems to not be too concerned with the fact that they were morally bankrupt people. In the end, it looks like the cross, where every single one of us was shown God's love for us in our brokenness. And that brokenness, I'm coming to find, never quite fully disappears from our lives. Yet, God still loves us. Hear me on this. I'm not preaching a gospel that says that you can just get away or get off the hook uh, with whatever you've done and just keep going on living your life however you please. I'm preaching a gospel that says you are broken and your shame drives you to do broken things even things you aren't always aware that you're doing. But it also says, you are a beloved child of God, and all that God wants is for you to accept that and spend time with him. Because when you spend time with him, staying close to him, you see something in him that won't let go of you. It's captivating. It's beautiful. 
and it changes what you think about yourself and what you think about God. Brennan Manning said, the engaged mind, illuminated by truth, awakens awareness. The engaged heart, affected by love, awakens passion. This essential energy of the soul is not an ecstatic trance, high emotion, or sanguine stance toward life. It's a fierce longing for God, an unyielding resolve to live in and out of your belovedness. In other words, when you understand your brokenness and see how much you are loved by God, you begin to act differently. That's when the change starts to occur in your life. That's when you move from someone who hides after falling for the serpent's tricks in the garden into someone who runs back to your father because you know that you can always go to him with your weaknesses. You know that you can climb up into his lap or sit down beside him if you're too big for that kind of a thing and hear him say, I sure am glad you're here. I love you. I would argue that God allows you to continue to struggle with your false self who always wants to hide. Here's why. We'll see he did this with the Apostle Paul in just a minute. This is the great news of the gospel that Jesus came to reveal. It's not about how much or how little you sin. It's about how much you trust God to take care of your sin and your brokenness. How much you trust him to be your loving father who welcomes you like the pig filth covered prodigal that you are. You can't erase your sinful nature or ever be clean enough. And when you accept that, you find yourself in a place of utter hopelessness. And it's in that place when the only hope meets you and says, I love you. Let me embrace you, sin and all. And as you stay close to me, knowing who you are as my child, secure in your identity as my own, your life will begin to change. When this happens, and you embrace your brokenness and belovedness, something incredible happens in your life. And that's where this third truth comes in. Number three, God has called you with a purpose in your brokenness. We don't know much about what happened to the woman in John 8 after Jesus sent her on her way. But we do know of other disciples who spent time with him who did things just as terrible. The Apostle Paul was probably top on the list of people following Jesus who did some pretty bad things in their past. And so one time when some people in Corinth were attacking his ministry, he responded like this in 2 Corinthians 12. On my own behalf, I'll not boast except of my weaknesses. So if I should wish to boast, I wouldn't be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Think about this. Paul's ministry is being attacked and torn down. It's like all your co-workers are trying to get you fired all at the same time. And a good portion of this letter in 2 Corinthians is spent in defense of his ministry. But look at where he ends up. And look at what he concludes in his argument. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, those things you're trying to get me fired for. Why? Because it's not about what I do. It's not about my strengths or my ability to hide my shame. It's about knowing that stuff doesn't matter because I'm my father's child. And he loves me as I am. This combination does something really, really incredible. It calls us to actually move out. And Jesus does this over and over again. 
Henry Nouwen was a Dutch priest and theologian who gave up his position of prominence and prestige in the church uh, to go and work with special needs people. Really incredible story. You should check him out sometime. In his book, The Wounded Healer, he wrote, The great illusion of leadership, think being used by God when he uses the term leadership here, is to think that people can be led out of the desert by someone who's never been there. The more I study and learn about great Christian heroes, the more I come to find that the majority of them experience some kind of desert, a dark and painful place in life. And I'm learning more and more that God allows us to experience those places to shape us and form us. And I'm not in a position to answer the questions of why suffering happens, but I do see that it happens and that often beautiful things come after we pass through those deserts. And it comes out in the way that we minister to others, in the way that we show them who Jesus is. As human beings, God's given us an incredible ability to feel compassion, especially when it's toward a situation that we've experienced ourselves. It's why God commanded the Israelites to treat foreigners with kindness, because they knew what it was like to be a foreigner in Egypt. John Piper describes ministers of the gospel as recovering cripples in a room full of those who can't walk. Henry Nouwen would later write, through compassion, it's possible to recognize that the caring, craving for love that people feel resides also in our own hearts. That the cruelty the world knows all too well is also rooted in our own impulses. Through compassion, we also sense our hope for forgiveness in our friends' eyes and our hatred in their bitter mouths. When they kill, we know that we could have done it. When they give life, we know that we can do the same. For a compassionate person, nothing human is alien. No joy and no sorrow, no way of living and no way of dying. You ever met one of those people you can talk to and you can tell there's just something about them that breathes grace and love into your life and you feel like you could literally tell them anything? And somehow... Jesus will come through that conversation and say to you, neither do I condemn you. I'm finding those kind of people in life have been through some of the deepest, darkest, and driest places imaginable. They've looked at their own brokenness, but they've also felt in a deep way their own belovedness. And now this is how they just naturally live their lives. And I think this is what God wants for each of us. We know we're called to be like Jesus, but sometimes I think we feel we somehow have to take charge and make it happen as soon as possible. Instead, God somehow uses our brokenness, our weakness, to give us a way to enter into the pain others are feeling. That pain and brokenness keep us from becoming conceited ourselves. We know that the shame, the insecurity, the morally bankrupt behavior hold on, that they hold on to us, uh, that they hold on to, is there in us as well. But because we also know how much God loves us in our brokenness, we can reach them with the good news of how much he loves them in their brokenness. We can introduce them to the Father who wants to sit beside them just like he sits beside us. So what do we do now with all this information? We're broken. We're loved. We can reach others in our brokenness. Now what? Live as those who have nothing to lose. All is grace in the first place, and in your brokenness, you have nothing anyway. Live as those who are in love with the one who loves us. When you love someone, you naturally begin to emulate that person. You hang out with your, your spouse, your friends. You begin to act and think like they do. Do this not by straining to be like him, like, oh man, I've got to try to be more like Jesus today. But instead, put your entire focus on knowing him and becoming infatuated with him. This is what produces the change. And finally, live as what Henry Nouwen called wounded healers. Live as recovering cripples. 
if we are obsessed with the love and greatness of Jesus, we will begin to love and act in the world around us the way he did, as a healer of those who are broken. Now, this is one of the most difficult things to do. I promise you this is difficult. The shame that drives us always wants to come back to the surface, pleading with us to do something so that we won't die. In his memoir, written only a short while before his death, Brennan Manning concluded, All that is not the love of God has no meaning for me. I can truthfully say that I have no interest in anything but the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If God wants it to, my life will be useful through my word and witness. If he wants it to, my life will bear fruit through my prayers and sacrifices. But the usefulness of my life is his concern, not mine. It would be indecent of me to worry about it. When you look at your life through this lens, you get up with a different purpose in the morning. It's no longer the full list of things you have to do to measure up as a Christian. It's the excitement of pursuing the one who pursues you and loves you in your brokenness, no matter what. You see the people around you in their brokenness, and that brings you back to your own brokenness, where God met you with his chesed, his loving kindness, his steadfast love, that he showed the woman caught in adultery. If you would, bow your heads. We'll, I'm going to give an altar call and we'll close in prayer. My hope this morning is that you've caught a glimpse of the God who loves you as you are, not as you should be. If you're broken this morning, whether it's from something way back in your past or something you're even in the middle of right now, and you want to meet the same Jesus who met the woman caught in adultery that day in John 8, I want you to start by coming forward this morning so we can pray with you. By coming forward, you're demonstrating your desire to accept your brokenness and bring that brokenness to the God who loves you as you are, not as you should be. This morning can be the first time you've met with him or even the thousandth time you've met with him. Every Christian begins their relationship with Jesus by bringing him their brokenness and every Christian continues their relationship with Jesus by bringing him their brokenness. You know, sinners make the best Christians, and some of the best Christians are sinners. So this morning, if that's you, if you're dealing with brokenness in your life, you know you're broken. Maybe you haven't even had the courage to even admit to anybody that you're broken. This is the safe place for you to come and meet with the Jesus who says, I know you're broken. I love you in your brokenness. Bring it to me, and I'll make something out of it. Lord, we stand in awe of who you are, your grace, your love for us. Thank you that you know who we are. You know all of our problems, all of our faults, all of our failures. Thank you for loving us in that. We literally have no other hope if you don't love us in that. Thank you for doing that, Lord. Thank you for doing that. We'll let the music keep playing. I'll be here for prayer. If you want to come down still and you haven't yet, it's great. We'll be here to pray. 